Good afternoon. My name is uh, Yair Shahar. Um, I am the product manager for the Cultural Heritage Division at uh, Phase 1. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Phase 1, uh, most people know us as a camera manufacturer. Uh, we do a little bit more than that, but I'll get through this uh, later on. Um, to tell you a little bit about myself, I come from industrial design background, studied, studied in the early 90s in a small place called uh, Jerusalem. Um, I joined, I worked as a designer for a few years in a small uh, company, then I had my own little uh, uh, studio. And then uh, in 2000, by some uh, luck, I would say, I uh, got myself into uh, Cytex. Um, if you work in, in the print industry, you should uh, be aware of that uh, brand name, at least, was one of the first large uh, high-tech uh, companies in the world, I think. Um, I was part of the Leaf uh, team. Leaf was a small company or small brand making digital cameras, actually the first um, digital or medium format digital back manufacturer, uh, actually. Um, so I worked there uh, for Leaf um, until 2009 under different umbrellas. So Leaf was part of Cytex, then part of Creo, Creo Cytex, and eventually Kodak. Uh, I was doing application design, meaning uh, a little bit of UI, UX, uh, test and um, quality checks and so on and so forth. Um, I moved to the UK in 2002 and I joined the field uh, team, shall we say, and doing anything from sales and marketing to service and support in different roles. I was also a sales manager for a while, a business development, uh, business, uh, development manager. Um, and then in 2009, uh, Phase 1, which was LEAF's main competitor, acquired LEAF from um, Kodak. Uh, for a while, the brand uh, stayed uh, independent, so it was part of the Phase 1 uh, uh, group. Um, it was called LEAF, then Mamiya LEAF, so I stayed within that uh, um, uh, group, or let's say subdivision. And about five years ago, uh, we decided that uh, cultural heritage uh, from being, uh, I wouldn't say a niche market, but from being like a, a market that, yeah, we sell anyway, and we have this customer and that customer, we actually started recognizing it as, as a real potential for a whole new segment uh, in the market. Uh, and then I became the product manager for this uh, group. Um, a little bit of background information about uh, Phase 1. Started in uh, 1993, uh, making scanning backs. So this is essentially a scanner or a mini scanner that is uh, fitted on a, on a medium format camera or a large format camera with a line sensor that is uh, the same kind of sensors uh, you have on the flatbed scanners, desktop scanners and so on. Um, and over the years, phase one has grown, uh, not only in uh, people and the number of employees and offices and uh, places we are um, um, active in, but also the areas we cover in terms of uh, products and uh, applications. Um, so we now have essentially uh, two uh, divisions. One is the uh, speciality for photography or what we would like to call SP and that covers professional photographers, studios, um, um, car photography, architecture, fashion, uh, all these uh, things, but also uh, landscape photographers and the pro amateurs and uh, enthusiasts and so on and so forth. Basically, people who love taking pictures, who appreciate a very high resolution, whether it's for printing or for anything that requires such high resolutions, 
we are talking about 150 megapixels uh, uh, cameras that you can uh, backpack with, you can travel with, but on the industrial side, uh, we're looking at the uh, aerial cameras, for instance, and those can go on drones, but can go on uh, fixed wing uh, aircraft. And usually these systems can have uh, uh, PC controllers with them. Some cameras are actually multiple lenses, multiple uh, digital back uh, solutions, and we make the software from them for them, software that runs on the special devices but also on tablets um, on ipads and things like that um, in terms of manufacturing capabilities we basically other than the sensors uh, the sensor itself the, the silicon chip we make everything in-house so we design and produce uh, lenses glass um, and of course the digital backs, so all the electronics and firmware, everything is developed uh, and uh, manufactured in-house. We do have uh, partnerships with uh, other manufacturers such as uh, Schneider and uh, Rodenstock for some of the lenses, whether it's the design or also some manufacturing of some parts of them. Um, and of course we have partnerships with other players in the industry for making uh, copy stands, uh, for making some uh, plugins, uh, some software plugins, and things like that. Um, yeah, so these are essentially these, let's say, three areas. Of course, you can s split them into uh, smaller sub areas. Uh, cultural heritage imaging, when we say cultural heritage, obviously, we're looking at uh, museums, archives, libraries, uh, and a lot of different things between them. Uh, meaning that it can be a small institute, so it can be a, a university that uses uh, cameras or camera equipment for a research, uh, but also for a recording and archiving of some collections. It can even be an individual um, photographer who does, who provides, um, let's say, art or fine art reproduction work for. Um, customers and these can be collectors or can be the artists uh, the artists and, uh, themselves um, yeah so in, in, in my job of course I work with the uh, R&D uh, on developing the product and defining the, the feature capabilities uh, specifications but also working as part of the marketing team to make all these uh, lovely brochures and videos and webinars and in a way be the face of the team or the face of the company when it comes to meeting all these customers but then also doing webinars like we're doing today. Um, just a bit of name dropping uh, and everybody knows all these big names uh, starting with Google who are actually apparently is one of our largest uh, customers they do a lot of aerial mapping so when you look at the Google Maps for instance and you click the satellite uh, button what you're seeing is not really a satellite image because uh, shooting this kind of quality and resolution from a satellite requires a satellite to be a very high um, military spec and that doesn't exist in the commercial world so what you're seeing is actually aircraft flying typically uh, below uh, the clouds so they can actually see something if it's a satellite it can't always see uh, through clouds but anyway they use many cameras on aircraft and so on and so forth um, then you have anything from the MoMA in New York, the British Library, Getty Images uh, Archive, Walt Disney even. And when we talk about uh, the subject matter, that can be books, manuscripts, uh, all sorts of documentation, uh, film collections. So negatives, positives, uh, glass plates, and then printed material, uh, whether it's film, photographic film or anything else and it doesn't necessarily have to be ancient stuff it can be um, relatively recent uh, municipal type documents but somebody has to do, uh, record them somebody has to digitize them uh, for future purposes for research 
uh, but also so people can go back and, and, and dig into archives and find information. What we find out, and that's very relevant now in these days in, in, in the current pandemic, is what we see f and from talking to many of these customers is everybody is realizing the importance on, of uh, having digital uh, copies of everything they have. So all these collections, uh, if we don't digitize them, uh, and if something like the current pandemic is happening again and people uh, may never be able to access them again or access will be very limited because of social distancing or something similar, uh, it just raises the importance and think about being able to visit a museum and think about uh, schools visiting museums and so on. Everybody understands that uh, having online access to some or most or even all of these collections is uh, becoming crucial. Um, even to the extent of some, some documents or some objects, uh, they are so old and so fragile that it's actually becoming critical to digitize them as soon as possible. Because if you wait another two years or three years or however long it will take for everybody to come back to normality, uh, these objects may not exist at that time. So it is important um, to get um, all this stuff done now. Um, in terms of products, we make uh, solutions, we make systems, uh, but of course solutions and systems are made of uh, components. And we specialize in making cameras, and cameras that are made specifically for a reproduction. So as you can see, they don't necessarily look like a camera that you um, hold in your hand and play with knobs and, uh, and change um, settings and so on and so forth. In fact, some of them don't even have screens on them because they're literally designed to be used uh, tethered. So they're connected to a PC or a, or, or, or a Mac. Um, and we also make the software for them, Capture One CH. And uh, some of you might you might be familiar with uh, Capture One. I think it's considered to be one of the leading or one of the best, um, let's say, capture and image processing um, software suites. Uh, we took it and added a few features that are unique to cultural heritage that help with uh, streamlining some of the workflows, uh, be it film scanning, where you need to uh, repeatedly get the best uh, image quality out of each and every frame. If it's, uh, for instance, um, negatives that you need to invert uh, quickly, but again, make sure that all the detail is there, that uh, um, uh, exposure is correct, that everything is done uh, to a specific, let's say, standard even. Uh, we also make a copy stand. And copy stand, it's a piece of hardware, but in our case, it's a smart piece of hardware, meaning that it actually communicates with the software and with the camera. So when somebody needs to scan a, a document or an item at a specific resolution, they can use Capture One to just type in, say, 600 PPI, press a button, and the camera and the copy stand will move up and down as, as necessary, uh, refocus if necessary, uh, before you actually take the picture. Um, the cameras themselves, as I mentioned, uh, they are designed specifically for this kind of uh, applications, but they share a lot of the technology and some of the components with, for instance, our aerial cameras. So it's all about robustness, it's all about uh, durabili durability, whether you're using the, the actual mechanical or physical shutter in the lens, or whether you use the electronic shutter, these are designed to run on and on and on and on and on for, for, for weeks and months and years even. Uh, I know some customers have been using our shutters and sensors and so on for, let's say, 10, 15 years running uh, 15, 20 million uh, captures and so on. So think about this and even when you think in journalism uh, terms, when somebody shoots a sports, for instance, 
even these people don't really get to those uh, numbers. They will swap their cameras uh, much sooner than uh, you might expect. Um, yeah, so it's a lot about integration and workflow, and you'll probably hear these words again and again and again. Um, in terms of lenses, we also design and make the lenses specifically for this kind of application to make sure that uh, we get the best image quality, best sharpness, but uh, best uh, in terms of uh, lack of distortion, I should say. Um, yeah, and how they all work together and we supply firmware updates and things like that. So, so these can add features and functionality and maybe fix some bugs or uh, improve stability like many other electronic uh, devices when it comes to uh, capture 1ch if you have any background in the let's say print or prepress uh, industry you, you will know when i say things like uh, lab color readouts these are available um, we also comply to standards such as uh, metamorphose Fudgy and the newer ISO 19264. These are all designed to make sure that whoever uses any, let's say, reasonable camera to digitize uh, cultural heritage objects, these standards uh, are there to make sure that you're using the camera in a correct manner, meaning that you get a, a certain type of, uh, of course, resolution, but also sharpness. Uh, exposure, detail, shadow, highlight, uh, noise, all these things. So regardless of who is using the camera and for what, um, what application, the standard or at least the minimum standard and the minimum quality uh, standard is, uh, is there. Um, and then we add tools like capture resolution ruler. So when you capture an image, you can measure a ruler that's in the image and it'll take you what it'll tell you what was the capture resolution we can uh, correct the images in terms of alignment in terms of um, uh, straightening them distortion um, things like that um, we also have what i mentioned before the auto ppi which is essentially a one one button press you set up your uh, desired uh, resolution or the field of view or the size of the object and you press the button and the camera and the column will adjust themselves so you get the right kind of uh, uh, resolution uh, the columns come in or the copy stands they come in different uh, sizes so they can be something that sits on a on a desk it can be something that sits on the floor with a longer or a taller column and the same column can also be wall mounted and that gives you the extra flexibility so it can sit higher on the wall and then you can have your own desk or your own trolley or any other support uh, think about when you scan larger objects like maps and drawings you need that extra distance so having the column on the wall will allow you to do that um, then we start looking at what else is part of a uh, cultural heritage and of course traditionally it's all to do with uh, paintings drawings books uh, documents manuscripts and so on but especially manuscripts what about these ancient uh, manuscripts what about those old uh, or the um, old masters paintings and how can we digitize them but then how can we also investigate them a little bit further and see for instance what sits underneath uh, the top uh, varnish layer or the top uh, oil paint um, um, did the artist do anything uh, else when they made the first drawing uh, compared to what you are actually seeing in the museum when you see the piece of art on the wall um, and so on and so forth that brought that that brought us into what we call MSI or multispectral imaging Multispectral imaging is basically uh, using uh, light other than the visible light. So using, for instance, uh, ultraviolet or infrared, and then using a camera and or filters that allow the sensor to record 
uh, parts of the spectrum that are invisible to the human eye. And what we essentially do is we make a system uh, which uses a near, an, an almost standard camera. It's just a camera that uh, the, the normal filter that blocks infrared light from coming through is replaced with a clear glass uh, filter. And then if you want to use the camera for a normal imaging, for normal photography, you basically place the same kind of filter in front of the lens. So that allows you to use it like any other camera. Uh, where it's uh, usable, we see two applications. One of them is uh, what we call multiband. And multiband um, is usually used for things like paintings uh, and pieces of art. But we also see it being used for forensics applications, for instance, when uh, certain types of filters and lights can uh, help you discover traces of uh, uh, blood and other bodily fluids um, and find some other uh, materials and pigments on clothing, um, different types of crime scene investigation properties, um, and so on. Um, the, the, the newest uh, baby, I should say, is uh, 3D imaging. And when we say 3D imaging, uh, yes, of course, you can go online and go into a retail um, website and look at an object and turn it around. It will be high quality and you can zoom in and see it from all sides and so on. This is definitely part of it. But beyond that, there's what we call uh, 3D scanning and generation of uh, 3D models. Now, when I say 3D, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a full-on 3D object. It can even be a book that you scan, but the book is uh, so old that the pages are slightly, uh, um, slightly bent or broken or some bits and pieces mi missing, or they're so curvy that you cannot really flatten them because you, you, you might break them that turns them into a 3D or a 2.5D object. And if you have the right kind of system that can scan them and add that level of uh, depth, I would say, or just add another um, angle of view and then make it into uh, a model, that can help you a lot in terms of understanding the structure of the object and if it's a book, for instance, you can read a page that's not fully straight. If somebody's using OCR, for instance, uh, that can help a lot further down the line. So now I'll, 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 I'll go, obviously we don't have too much time, so I'll just go um, through the basics of uh, these two very interesting uh, applications, just to give you some example of what we've been doing and what we've been involved with in terms of uh, projects and in terms of a little bit about the product as well. Um, so uh, um, Cult Arm 3D, it's a project that is run by a, a research institute called uh, Fraunhofer, one of the largest in the, in the world, I would say. The, I think last time I checked, they had something like just over 26,000 employees worldwide, mostly in Germany, although they do have a subsidiary in, uh, I think it's Singapore, uh, with several people there. Um, Fraunhofer do all sorts of different things. They're involved in chemistry, in, uh, in optics, in, in biology, in, uh, I would say, art and culture, all sorts of things, but they do have a small division um, focusing on cultural heritage applications and specifically digitization of cultural heritage. And they started the project, I would say, probably eight or nine years ago um, when they were looking at, at a system that can make uh, 3D imaging or 3D scanning simple, easy, uh, but still provide the highest quality. They were looking at some sort of a high throughput uh, solution and the image you see on the left here this is how they started it was a conveyor belt uh, based uh, system uh, where the object uh, runs along the um, the belt 
and then there's a whole heap of um, small industrial cameras moving around it on this arc uh, with specially made um, LED lights uh, going on and off and that was basically generating hundreds of uh, images and of course then the software uh, does all the photogrammetry and generates the um, the model as you go or almost as you go of course they, at the time the cameras were not um, very high resolution so they needed uh, quite a few of them and they were also incorporating it with the uh, laser scanner because the laser scanner is still very very accurate and in terms of, of resolution it provides a huge amount of data but of course laser uh, scanning cannot show you uh, color, cannot show you shadows, um, cannot really give you the sense of uh, texture. So that sort of mix of uh, cameras and laser scanners was very uh, beneficial. And then since then and until these days, obviously technology has moved on. Uh, we actually met them a few years ago and started talking about maybe doing something uh, together. And I should probably, maybe I'll try to switch. Hopefully that, that's going to work. I'll switch to a little uh, film and just show this to you. It's about one minute, just over one minute, so just bear with me, but it gives you a good idea of uh, what's it all about. Here we go. you uh, hope you enjoyed this little one it's actually really brand new uh, film that they sent us uh, last week um, yeah what, what, what you saw is essentially the system you place this the object on a turntable and the turntable unlike the one you see in this image it's more like this one it's um, transparent so the camera can actually go underneath and shoot the underside of the object but um, the the great thing about it is that the system is designed to do uh, let's say uh, something we we can call it a pre-scan so they they use a backlight and they do a certain but a fairly low number of images creating a bunch of uh, silhouettes of the objects and based on that the, the system will actually design or put together a plan in terms of number of images and angles and uh, and distances and so on and so forth and of course you can program it to say well I'm really focusing on the face of this uh, sculpture but I do need the dimensions and everything else of the rest of it but in terms of resolution for instance I really need just the head so you can still get a very very good model of the whole sculpture sculpture but only the head will be at a very high resolution and that obviously saves time, saves um, uh, storage space for instance for all these images and for the model and it will help with uh, speeding things up. Uh, they should have uh, some sort of an online demonstration of the system available uh, quite soon but they have shown it uh, during last year, they have shown it uh, to a few institutes 
uh, including the one that the first system is actually installed in, which is a university um, in Vienna, in Germany. And initially they were using it so to scan globes and globes are obviously a, a challenge because some of them, of course, they're all round, but some of them can be shiny, which is tricky. Some of them are mounted on some wooden frames. Some of them are uh, damaged uh, or they have very different types of uh, textures on them. So that's why they needed a flexible system that can move the camera around, but maintain, let's say, the magnification and the distance. They also designed the lighting specifically for that. So for instance, going about uh, shooting uh, areas with the uh, highlights on shiny objects, they can actually uh, do the first shot and the system realizes that this is a shiny area and it will actually send the camera to take uh, pictures from multiple angles of the same um, section or same area in the image or in the object. And between all these images, it can actually use one to compensate for another and, and gather all the information and can actually create the real data of that, uh, that uh, area. Now, as I said, this is still not a product that's on the shelf, but uh, it's probably not far from it. Uh, and once it's ready, I believe it will be a major break breakthrough because it's uh, still... While it's very, uh, it looks very expensive and very advanced and so on, it will still be relatively compact, relatively portable. Um, so if you think about researchers taking it, uh, traveling to uh, remote sites even, or just in different galleries and so on, think about mounting the robotic arm on, the, on a trolley that is also a robot in itself and sending it into a gallery leaving it there for uh, overnight to run around and to scan all these objects. Now, this is obviously might sound like a pipe dream, but the technology will allow that to happen at some point. Um, yeah, this is kind of the rest of the story. Very high resolution. It goes down to even less than 20 microns, which is uh, similar to what you get with laser scanners. But again, you have the extra uh, information in terms of color and shadows and light and tones and so on and so forth. Uh, then we look at the uh, multispectral imaging. And uh, multispectral imaging, we know from the aerial side of things, where there can be uh, infrared cameras, for instance, mounted on airplanes, and they, ho they help with uh, controlling uh, crop diseases and things like that. Uh, but specifically for cultural heritage, like I said, we're looking at, I would say, mainly two applications, uh, art, and then uh, all the documents. And it's all about readability and being able to uh, uh, read uh, burned pieces of paper or damaged uh, pieces of paper and so on. Um, and again, of course, we had to develop some kind of a product, some kind of a, of a solution. Um, and we came up with, of course, using the one of our uh, repro, repro cameras, the IXG 100 megapixels, uh, and maybe the 150 megapixel IXH will join at some point in the future. Um, but we make sure that the same camera can be used for other applications as well. So you can use, put a filter in front of the lens and just use it as a normal camera. Um, and the camera can sit on a copy stand, but like you see in this image, it can also sit happily on a tripod. Uh, there is a filter wheel that is uh, positioned in front of the, of the camera. And the combination of uh, different filters and the different lights allow you to, let's say, slice the spectrum into small pieces. And each of these uh, pieces will show you maybe different parts or different components or different materials in the subject matter. Um, for narrowband, we have uh, UV, visible, and infrared lights. So you'll have three on each side of the object, like you see in this image. Um, for what we call narrowband, which is the more, let's say, scientific approach uh, for uh, readability and for some other things like forensics and so on, 
we made these uh, LED panels. They have 16, I believe, different LEDs in each of them. And of course, they everything comes nicely packaged in a in a, some kind of a travel uh, suitcase uh, and will include the relevant uh, power supplies and uh, adapters and USB cables and you know all the paraphernalia around it. Um, filter wheel is again is something we kind of pick up uh, almost uh, off the shelf uh, components and we made them work for us. Everything is controlled uh, through um, the capture software. So everything uh, that has some kind of a USB connection goes into a hub and the software controls everything. So it's the camera, it's the filter wheel, of course, focusing, but then it's also turning the lights on and off depending on the wavelength and the, um, and the part of the spectrum that uh, is required. Um, now, there is something called Charisma. Uh, and I mentioned metamorphose and fudgy and all these guidelines for normal digitization work. Charisma is some something kind of similar, but it's a it's a it's a project that uh, started a few years ago uh, with a small team from the British Museum, and then there's a small consortium from other institutes as well. Uh, there is a link here, uh, but if you type Charisma guidelines for a multispectral, Google will probably be smart enough to find it for you. Um, the whole idea is to say, well, you're capturing, say, a, a, an oil painting, and it needs to show you everything that you need in order to uh, get the information out of it. If that's the case, you need to capture it at uh, this wavelength, this wavelength, and that wavelength. Make sure that you have this exposure and that exposure, that everything is within uh, range and so on. And normally you would capture six images and develop them into eight images. And I'll, and I'll explain uh, why. Um, we have one of our colleagues who's actually... I wouldn't say she's a member, but she 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 works with these uh, people, uh, which is a you know it's a it's a it's an honor for us to be part of this whole uh, thing, even if uh, by just being invited to uh, spend some time talking to these people and understanding their needs, it'll help us when we come to developing maybe future products. Um, so we capture six images. Uh, of course, the vis visible light images and the uh, visible light with an IR pass filter. So we let the IR uh, light come uh, through and hit the sensor. Um, UV reflectance, UV uh, luminance. And again, it's all combinations of l different wavelengths of light in filters to either block or pass some of the wavelengths. And infrared which usually it's the longer wavelength and that usually is the one that allows you to go deeper into say under layers or under drawings uv can be used because it's shorter can also can, can normally be used for things like varnish or the top layers of the uh, of the painting uh, so we capture these images but we export them all aligned, adjusted, and then we add another two images, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So these are the six raw images as they are being captured in uh, Capture One, or they're actually captured with a special software for multispectral imaging, but we can view them in Capture One. Uh, it's good to know that the little target you see in the middle, um, it's made of a special type of a silicon, PTFE, and the unique thing about it is that regardless of the uh, wavelength of the light you throw at it, uh, its values uh, remain um, the same. So you know that black is black, white is white. Uh, so you can use it for white balance, for instance, but uh, especially to make sure that your exposure is correct. Now we designed the system, so it's all automated. It's all integrated. So you press the button, it'll... Uh, measure everything and will adjust everything accordingly. So 
you hardly ever end up with an image that is too underexposed or overexposed or things like that. Um, then the, the exported images, um, you, now you see that I, I'm actually showing eight instead of six. And the reason for it is that there are two added and they are like false color images where basically two of the channels were uh, flipped and that usually allows you to see some extra information about some specific uh, pigments, for instance. Now, bear in mind that just for the purpose of this uh, presentation, some of these images are actually tweaked, uh, tweak them so you will actually see something. Because normally in these two black and white images, the visible, uh, sorry, the UV, uh, IL and the VIL images, they will normally come out very, very black, especially with this subject matter, mostly because in this uh, specific uh, painting, there isn't any pigment that actually reflects uh, or luminates any of these uh, wavelengths. So you will see a black image with a, just a shade of something slightly lighter where the target is. Now you will notice that uh, the image on the top left actually looks very different. And this is the infrared image. That's where the infrared wavelength goes a little bit deeper. And that actually shows you the painting underneath. Or if there was an underdrawing that the artist uh, sketch, for instance, that's where you'll be able to see this. Anything beyond that or deeper than that will already require things so it re require things like x-ray, for instance, and that's something we, we don't do. It's not our speciality. There are some other devices who are specifically made for that. Um, yeah, I mean, here you can actually see, I just zoomed in a little bit, and you can see that the false color image, for instance, shows you that a certain type of uh, blue pigment uh, that otherwise is not even shown comes up as green instead of just looking red, like on this one. Uh, and this could tell the researcher, for instance, that it comes from a different region in the world or a different um, a time, for instance, it could be more modern than the rest of it. Uh, you can also see it here. So in the false color image, the white pigment that shows in the visible image comes up in yellow. And that again tells us that this might come from a, a different era. So it, maybe it's a lot more modern. And if I was, uh, for instance, somebody working in art forensics, or even just for research, I, I might think, mm, hang on, maybe the artist uh, did something and then um, 50 years or 100 years later, somebody took the original painting and either retouched it or decided to change it slightly, or maybe it was damaged and somebody decided to uh, make a quick uh, repair and, and sell it on. Uh, there's all sorts of different stories and wonderful things to, to discover about these things. Um, yeah, and here you see the, the, the painting underneath. And that, I think, this is definitely oil painting. I'm not sure about the uh, underlayer. I think that was also... Uh, uh, in oil painting. Now, some of these are uh, basically pieces of art that we kind of, I wouldn't say fake, but we actually make them specifically for this kind of uh, tests. So we take an old drawing and then just use completely different pigments to paint something over it. Uh, so this could be just an example, but sometimes you can uh, bump into these cases in real life. So you go into an auction house and they will have a suspicion that one of the pieces of art might not be the original or might have gone through some retouching at some point. And that's where this technology can uh, uh, discover all these things uh, without needing to scrape any of the paint or to cut any pieces of the painting. Of course, at some point you might still need to do that but you you definitely don't want to start scraping the top layer of the whole painting. So if you only spot an area that you suspect that has something weird going on in it, then you might just do an imaging of that small area and then just do the repair or the further analysis in that section and not 
around the whole uh, uh, painting, which of course will take a lot longer. And of course, in terms of damage, it will cost you know a lot more to either repair it or to throw it away afterwards. Uh, some stories, general um, reproduction stories, but these are, uh, at least I, I found them as, a, as sort of uh, inspiring. Uh, Courtauld Institute in London, uh, they're based in um, Somerset House um, on the Strand. Now, actually, the, the Institute is essentially a school, and the school is actually is moving or started moving last last year, but their uh, archive and their collections of uh, photographic material uh, is staying at the Somerset House. And they started a project a few years ago based on some uh, lottery money. Uh, so lottery money came in to uh, allow for purchasing equipment, but also for staffing uh, the project and so on. Um, they currently have something like 80 volunteers with, when I say various skill levels, some of them are actually disabled. So they come in uh, once a week and spend a couple of hours and somebody trained them on the basics of operating the camera and handling the material. But there are some great uh, stories there. One of the nicest stories was uh, Anthony Kirsting's um, um, collection. Uh, he was an, a, a, a military photographer traveling around the Middle East. And at some point, I think there were stories about him being a spy because uh, as a photographer, he was allowed to enter um, all sorts of different places in, in Syria, in Egypt, uh, and so on and so forth that other people might not have access to. And he was sort of accused as being a spy because he brought back some valuable uh, images from all these places. Um, now, uh, they actually developed an online booking system for the employees, so they can actually book themselves into uh, this session, that session, uh, to make sure that, the, I think they have three cameras now, or three workstations, to make sure that all these uh, systems are continuously being used. Uh, they do have the regular staff who do uh, monitoring of and quality assurance and also help the volunteers check that everything is set up for, uh, correctly. Um, the next story, that's actually quite, uh, quite new to us. Uh, aerial imaging. Aerial imaging, I was mentioning uh, Google and so on, but aerial imaging existed um, in the World War II and even before that. And uh, some countries or some governments or some local councils um, sit on fairly large collections of aerial film. And aerial film, uh, if it's in an archive, uh, it's nice to have, but it's not really usable. If it's um, being digitized and comes up in a digital form that people can use uh, or people can access online and can zoom in and can learn something from then that becomes very useful and this specific story is about uh, um, a customer or an archive in one of the uh, south german states um, and they use all these films and digitizing them to uh, locate um, areas where um, World War II bombs um, still exist and they actually use the images to determine whether this bomb has actually exploded or maybe it's an unexploded bomb and of course this is usable not just for, for safety but specifically when you try to design a new um, let's say motorway or a new industrial estate or a new housing estate and you don't want people to start walking around and, uh, be, and getting uh, blown up. So it is uh, very useful. And of course, it can be used for surveying. Uh, it can be used for building all sorts of things and also for um, learning of, let's say, a council needs to know the borders of uh, the council 50 years ago or 40 years ago. And... 
the only way to know it unless somebody actually walked around and mapped everything and, uh, re and wrote everything down. The only way to, to learn about these things is by looking at uh, aerial images. So this is it in, you know, relatively short amount of time. Uh, it was a real pleasure for me and um, more, more of this you can find on our website. And of course, through the guys at the university, uh, you can probably um, get in touch with me or with one of my uh, colleagues if you have further questions or need to learn more or interested in what else is that we're doing. And yeah, maybe I will meet again in the near future. So thanks again and take care. Stay safe.